it's been really cool to kind of get a better grasp of it and likewise you know every time i speak to someone out in america and u.s based this uh Really interesting to see, you know, the different dynamics in terms of how the game is played from one side to the other, um, you know, how the program looks, the growth of the game, their vision. Um, and I just, the, the type of recruitment that you have, you know, I know the convention's up next week and wow, what promotion yeah. you have for that. Like, we don't have anything like that here in the UK. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of people, I, I've come across many people that have come over for it, for it even mm. from that aren't part of the association, but you know, like you said, it's so big. It's incredible the amount of soccer people that they collect in one location. Absolutely. And and that's what the the fascinating thing is, is, uh, you know, when that comes as a collective in terms of, uh, you know, all the people in the US convention, how that looks, the scope of it, um, the determinants of how that looks in the future, the different types of trends, etc. You know, it's really exciting how that looks across such a huge country as the US in terms of, you know, it's bigger than the size of the UK, for example, and how you deploy that for a country that has so many different individuals, so many ethnicities, backgrounds, states, the differences in programs, trying to compete with the other national sports, for example. What an exciting time to be part of soccer. No, it, it really is. And I mean, the convention is so fun because it is so inclusive of all levels, all genders, like men's, women's, youth, high school, club, college, professional, like, you know, it is a little bit more domestic based, but there you get international presence, not just from its attendance, but from the people presenting at it. My husband is an American football coach, so they have a convention and it's so different than ours. Ours is so much better. <laughs> uh, so, so it's really cool to, to see, like you said, that growth and just like, honestly, how expanded our soccer community is getting, um, not just here in the States, but how much more connected, especially with how many more leagues are on TV and people mm -hmm. are getting more excited about, you know, the global impact and, and connection that it creates because there are more women playing in different countries. There's more league available uh, to watch, to, to go and make a living at. Like, it's just really cool. It's a cool, cool time for our sport, for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, say you get one platform that streams just for the US, for example, and you get all the college games just at that level, which start the stream in terms of the US, you know, magnitude. You add all the other layers in terms of domestic sports, in terms of just for that US soccer element. Wow, what a streaming platform you'd have just without the national and, and youth level teams that would be part of it if that was a future scope, for example. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It, it makes a big difference. And, you know, you mentioned just the recruiting and, and getting the name out there. Like, it's it's incredible now that you can literally just pop on Hulu and watch college games. And it makes it that simple because a lot of times you get young women that are like, I know I can play for you. And you're like, cool, what game did you watch? They're like, oh, I've never seen you play. I'm like, how do you know you can play for my team if you've never seen the team play? Uh, so So it's really nice. That access is wonderful. I love that. And that's that's an important point there. You know, that different stride in terms of recruitment now that you say is, you know, back, say, maybe 10 years ago when there was less streaming, less games, less sort of scope to share, you know, the, the visuals and, and internationally. But when a player could approach and say, I can play for you, take them on, say, you know, a, a trial on the grass, they're able to represent their skills and how that would fit in, etc. But now it's like, well, I can play for you. But as you say there, it's like, well, actually, you haven't watched my team play. So how do you determine <laughs> that effect? So it sort of turns the stride in terms of recruiting more into the, the tide that is more beneficial to coaches, I suppose. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, especially for a program like ours that because of our location and our academic profile, we recruit everywhere in the country. Uh, and then we have a really great international representation as well. Having that access to games is also not just for recruiting, but great for our families because if they can't come to something, they can still pop on the match and watch it. And for some of our players, those are odd hours of the evenings for the families. Um, we have a young lady from New, uh, from New Zealand. So they are quite literally on the opposite side of the world when it comes to time zone. Uh, but it's great because otherwise they really don't get to see those exciting moments and those game days for their daughter. So, so that's really wonderful. So you are recruiting, you're currently head coaching. It's the turn of 2024. Um, but to give an introduction to yourself and to play for your journey i hand it over to you oh sure uh, so my name is shannon ely Noll. i am the head coach at the queen's university of charlotte we are a division one program located in charlotte north carolina we compete in the asun conference 
um, which is a wonderful conference. We span the entire Southeast region of the country in terms of our affiliated schools. So we get to travel a bunch and play really fantastic competition. Um, and I am entering into my third season here at the university. So three years in, what sort of changes did you bring when you initially were appointed to the role? <laughs> <laughs> what a loaded question. So uh, I will start by saying, you know, I think uh, I brought myself, which in it, in its own way, you're going to you're going to change your program because great coaches, I think, are authentic and have to live their truth in what they think is best for a program. I took over from a coach who was only here for about one calendar year, maybe a little longer because it was COVID. So, you know, they didn't get to work with the team right away. Um, and she's an incredible coach, but her tenure was so short. She didn't get to implement a ton, but she had so much success. It made a big impact on the group that I inherited. Uh, so it was a slow process because I had to learn a lot about who we were before I knew where we had to go and start our process of changing into the program that I wanted to run because good, bad, or indifferent, I always knew taking over the program, there was going to be a change of, okay, it's not going to be how I want it to be, no matter if they're successful or not. So I have to learn who we are so that I can help guide them towards where I think we need to be to be successful in the long term. Now, the second part of that question is I took over this program when we were a division two school. So for the first four to five months, we were competing in Division Two. We were in our off-season, but we that's the level we were at. And then we announced that we were transitioning to Division One just that fall. So that was a massive change for everybody, not just mm -hmm. myself, but for the student-athletes, for the program, for the team, for the school itself. Uh, so there's been an extraordinary amount of change in these last couple of years, some because I was a new coach and we brought in a new staff and others because our school is going through this incredible transition and moving up into Division One. I. I love that. And when it comes down to that, obviously there's a lot of change management process, as you say, that comes part of that, you know, the changing attitudes, the commitment, the desire, you know, whether there's any uncertainty about, you know, players' positions, coaching positions, uh, the style of play, whether that looks in terms of culture values. That whole change can spread right across every little detail when a new head coach comes in or anyone in that sort of position uh, in, in other professions. But um, for the type of program that you wanted to be, also you've stepped up from Division 1 into Division 2. You've had a change in recruitment and, and making little changes in terms of your staffing, how that then uh, delivers over a period of time. And then, you know, from year three to year one, that looks totally different. And if you're, in, you're still in position in three years time, for example, that might look different again, once uh, it's developed even further. But when you initially set out and you were like, right, I'm the head coach now, and you say, I want the program to be this, what is it that you wanted the program to be? It's So I define the first part of my coaching philosophy is that my job is to challenge everybody that I work with and work for to be better as a person, a student, and an athlete. And that includes myself, my staff, and, of course, my student athletes. And the big overarching tagline that we have really fallen into is the idea of forward together, no matter where we are, no matter who we are, what we're doing, because every year our team changes. The intention is how are we progressing forward? Because that's what I want my student athletes to graduate with. Obviously an incredible degree from a great university, but with a comfort and a happiness in life, challenging themselves to get better. And that sounds very cheesy probably, but I absolutely believe it. I think it's a really important skill learned and that you can develop during this important like time at university where how can you be happy and content in your life while still pushing yourself for new and better things? A lot of people are really uncomfortable looking and saying, what can I do next? because it makes them unsteady or not as grateful for what they have where they currently are. Mm -hmm. But those two things can overlap. And I think especially within sport, especially within the university setting, you can help these young people learn how to want more while being happy and grateful for where they are and what they've accomplished already. Because sometimes people get happy and grateful for what they've accomplished and they get complacent. But how do you push, right? I keep, I always tell them my job is not to clear the road for you. My job is to help you, get over hurdles that are in your road and sometimes put those hurdles in your road to challenge you to get better. So how do you look at that when you walk in the door and you say, Hey coach, I, I passed that Spanish test in that class. I got an A that I was struggling with. Great. What's next, right? Oh, I, I signed up for this internship 
and it's going to be wonderful and it's one semester and then at the end of the semester it's like great what's next right okay i want to score more goals i got 10 goals this year i want to score 15 you get 15 goals cool what's next right how are you happy in that progress and that growth um and the tagline for it together obviously that's the forward piece but it's also about learning to take care of each other and working collectively because we are a team sport it's not just you out there that looks very different when you as an individual are trying to develop and push yourself how you go about it and how you do things can be very different than how you have to do things when you exist a part of a team culture and team goals and aspirations, uh, especially the way our year is set up. We're a incredibly intensive season because we're about three to four months and we have 20 plus games jam packed into those months. So it's really fast and furious. That time is so much team based. And then the rest of the year for me can be a lot more individually based but it is still, can you elevate the parts to make the whole of the team better? And that's that together piece. Can you move forward together constantly? What an insight, what a depth discussion and piece in terms of that philosophy and how that works with the players and how that comes across. Um, I love when you say about pushing people even further and complacency because, you know, some people can sort of, uh, be in a position where I'm like, well, I want to achieve more. I wanted to do this. I wanted to have done that. But realistically, I didn't achieve that. So I should have X, Y, and Z, which I do have, and therefore I'm happy. And sometimes that can be a good mindset just to set us back a little bit and to push us forward. But then I'm also in the mindset where it's, well, yeah, that's good, but what's next? And I'm always like that. And mm -hmm. some people question, well, why can't you be happy with what you've got? And I'm like, but that's not good enough for me. I want the next best thing and then let's push for even further. And I suppose that comes from a mindset of someone being within sport and someone who wants to push to be higher level. So, you know, when you push a player like, oh yeah, I scored 10 goals this year, I had five assists and I started, you know, 12 out of 22 games. Well, next year, why can't you be starting all 22? Why can't you score more? And I, I, I'm absolutely big for that piece because it's always about those little improvements. And when I work with students, I do a lot of teaching myself and they're like, oh, sir, you should be happy with this. Well, no, actually, I want a lot more out of you because that's where my expectations are. So, therefore, you need to push yourself to live up to those expectations. And then over a few weeks, they start to deliver improved pieces of work and more pieces. And therefore, they've done more work than they would have done for another teacher. And like, that's expectations and standards that I've set and instilled with you. And therefore, you've worked up to them rather than me lowering the bar just because for us to meet in the middle, which you might do with someone else. So, I'm all for that camp about pushing and being uh, aspiring for the next best thing all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the important piece is not just, you know, a lot of people, like you said, you got the questions. Why can't you be happy with what you've done? Those things can coexist. You know, I think there's a lot of people that look at it and say you can't be grateful and show a desire for more at the same time because it takes away from the gratitude. And I don't think that's true. I think you can be grateful for where you are and what you've done for what you've been given and still look to the next and look to what is more. You know, just because I look at what my job is and the resources that we have here at Queens and I go to my boss and say, well, I would love a new locker room. I want to renovate our locker room. It doesn't mean I'm not grateful for what we have. It just means I see an area that I can give a better experience to my student athletes. So I'm going to ask about it mm -hmm. and I'm going to say how and I'm going to pursue it, not because I'm ungrateful, but because I see a way to improve. Those things can coexist and helping people learn the dichotomy of overlap as opposed to different existing ideas i think is a really important lesson especially today you know not to get like too crazy or down a rabbit hole like within social media and how like one note everything has to be like oh there's no nuance it's just yelling at the void of social media like no it's never that simple like things are complicated and learning how to balance those things i mean it's such a cool part of what the college level is because those years from 18 to 22 to 23 are so influential in terms of the adult development and it's a really cool way that you can try to help impact young people before they get out into the quote-unquote real world. <laughs> Absolutely, and I'm completely there with you because, you know, that, that coexistence I think is a really important piece as well because some people maybe think they have to be on either path one or path two. Well, actually, there can be a mm -hmm. path in the middle, so it actually extends out the three pathways. Uh, and therefore, once you're on the one in the middle, you can be happy with what you've got, you can build upon what you have. Therefore, you're improving the experiences that you've got. And it doesn't mean that there's only one end goal. You might have a possibility of three different end goals, which puts you in a better position because of the way that you've been pushed to do things on and off the field, what you've been able to do in terms of being part of the program, being at the college level and the university that you've chosen, the experience that the head coach has given you, the experience of your teammates. And there's so much within that that is jammed together which really helps grow the individual grow the player which is so beneficial as to why they select the program as to why a philosophy is built in a certain way and that forward together i love that real sort of essence of you know it's more than a program because everyone has to be 
collectively brought together to really instill the passions and desires on and off the pitch. And therefore, as much as they are a team, they have to push themselves individually because it is a sport. It is competitive at the end of the day as well. I agree. And so it's, it's fascinating when you speak to certain individuals and you start to find out their own philosophies, their own styles of thinking, their own sort of outlook towards the future and what they want to get out of it. And obviously, when we work in sport, we have to select so many different personalities. We get to meet them. Um, and that's where recruitment comes and plays such a fun part, because you can either bridge a squad together, depending on a load of personalities that gear towards the high aspirations and high level. You can gear towards those who are sort of mid level and you can sort of take a mix of those who are very good technically but their mindset really isn't in there so it's that recruitment piece which is really important but when it comes down to it what kind of player do you enjoy talking to the most the ones who really want to aspire for every available opportunity to them or players who are sort of mid-level who are happy to achieve a lot of achievements but very good technically but you can see they're they might not achieve it in the sport but you know they can still do well elsewhere yeah i yeah so my favorite type of player to recruit is honestly one that uh, we call them soccer nerds, soccer geeks, like whatever, like we, you know, my staff has made a decision to pursue this as our career. You know, you can do a lot of different things, um, but we've chosen to help develop young people through the sport of soccer. So finding those young people who love the sport as much as we do is such an important piece of what we've brought to our recruiting process since being here at Queens. Um, you know, the other piece of that that is paramount is we will never take somebody on our team, no matter how talented they are, if we don't think their values align with our program and who they are as a person. Because one, that's exhausting. <laughs> Managing somebody for four years who doesn't have kind of that alignment can be really challenging because you're always going to be working to help get them there because in the team space, you don't get to just exist as an individual. You have to be here for the team. Um, and second, I really take, there's a lot of responsibility in regards to the people that I bring into our team environment become teammates for my team that are already here. So if I bring in a freshman class of people who don't align with our values, who don't treat people well, who don't have the same belief, investment, and commitment as my current team, I'm not only putting stress on our staff, I'm putting stress on my players who I have a commitment to to take care of. So making sure that those people align and first and foremost who they are um, is the most important thing. And the funny thing is, is that always comes second because we go out and we watch and we're like, oh, you're a great soccer player you can be on our team. So that's the first thing, because it has to be. We're not a social club. We're not a rec team. Like, you have to be able to play of level. But the more important thing comes after that. You get to know the person, and you say, do you align with what we're doing? Are you committed to what our aspirations are? And are you going to be a good person for the people I'm responsible to take care of? Because, I mean, I have teammates from my college years that were in my wedding. You know, there are people that I still call and I still communicate and connect with because of the experience and what you go through together. And I want to make sure that that's the experience and the team, that together piece, right, of the four together is about the people that you bring into the team space. So that is paramount when we go through the recruiting. It comes second, but it's more important than the first part, uh, which is kind of funny. <laughs> And that's where the enjoyment of recruitment and sport comes into play, I suppose. But when you sort of want to extract those values, yes, you can observe so many different values on and off the pitch, maybe through their social media as well. And again, social media can portray an image that you wanted to portray. So that's not always the true essence. Uh, but you can watch game clip. You can go out and see them personally. You can sort of evaluate, say, three out of seven values that you have. How do you then, when you meet with them or maybe have that discussion, try to extract whereby you understand whether they're going to meet the other four values or the majority of them? Do you ask a certain type of question? Do you put a scenario in play? How do you sort of approach that? Yeah, I'm a very conversational recruiter. So there are certain questions that over the years I've learned will kind of give me cues and give me insight to players. Like Instead of asking them, do you watch the game? You ask, what clubs do you follow? Hmm. Who are your favorite players? Because then if they can speak to like, oh yeah, I love watching Chelsea women. I love, you know, watching the Aussie League. I love watching the NWSL. You know, Marta's one of my favorites for years. It's so cool that she's, like, in this retirement phase. Like, how they answer that question as opposed to being like, well, yeah, of course I watch soccer. Like, that's a very one-ended note question. 
So you learn different ways to kind of gauge information in the get to know you process. But my style is a lot more like, let's hop on the phone and let's have a conversation. How's your family? What do you do outside of soccer? What are you getting up to this weekend? Oh, I'm going to see a movie. What movie are you going to see? I love movies. Like, let's talk about it. Like, what are your favorite? There was a young woman that I was just uh, speaking to that is a voracious reader. So it's like, whenever we connect, I'm like, hey, what are you reading right now? And it's always a different book. And literally, I talked to her three days ago, and she's reading something completely new because she just crushes things. So that piece of it and that earnestness that you can pull out of young people, I think, helps me. Because you can tell how genuine somebody is when they get on the phone. Are they just checking boxes and trying to tell you what they think you want to hear? Or are they comfortable just sitting and having a conversation with you because that's the platform you're giving them? Can you just be a good person and genuinely enjoy getting to know somebody, learning about them? Are you asking as many questions as I'm asking you? All those little things you learn to pay attention to over the years. Um, and then, you know, especially when you get to watch people in person, you know, if it's a domestic player and we get to go out the fields, how do they treat their teammates? How are they on the bench? How do they interact with their parents when they're in on a visit? You know, do they speak poorly of their current coaches? Even if you don't agree with your coach, there's a way to speak towards them with respect without agreeing to them. Where you hear some players like, well, you know, coach has been making all these crazy decisions with their lineup and it's just so stupid. Well, I don't want, like, you're never going to agree with me all the time, but I don't need you back in the dorms calling me stupid. You know, even if you don't think it makes a difference. Mm. So those little bits and pieces you pick up with, and it's all just about communicating and getting to know somebody, you know, it's a process. I always joke that the recruiting process is the best combo of a job interview and dating, right? Mm. As silly as that sounds, you're, you're trying to put your best foot forward. You're trying to say, hey, you, I want you to come be a part of this thing, right? You're recruiting. You're bringing them on board. But you're also paying attention to that person and their personality. And it's like, I don't know if I like you or you fit in. Uh, we're going to move on. And that's okay. Yeah. We're not the right fit for you and you're not the right fit for us. Uh, and that's the piece of it. And people say no to us and we say no to others. And, and that's kind of a part of the game, making sure you're bringing in the right group for the group that already exists and progressing. Is even in personnel, you can move the team uh, in a direction, mm. uh, which is what we've done in these first couple of years. I was going to say to you, how long typically does the process last? But there you're sort of like, right, if it don't fit for you, it don't fit for us. Bang. That decision's made automatically. But for a player who you're in pursuit of, how long does that typically last? Oh, it's all over the place. For some, it's very quick. For others, it's very long. I'm a big believer in letting the player dictate timeline. Um, there are many that we will get to a point of like knowing this is a person that we could have in our program before they've gone through their process with other schools, just getting older. Um, you know, there are some international players that it's, you know, one of our current players, I think my first communication with them was probably a year before they actually committed to being a part of our program. And then I have others where it's a month long where you're on the phone a handful of times, you're watching a bunch of film, and they're just ready for it. Um, so it, it it's all dependent on the person. Um, and I think maybe some of that is because I like to give them the power of saying when they want to commit. Um, I don't believe in deadlines, which some uh, U.S. coaches at university do. They say, hey, here's the offer, and I need to know in two weeks' time. Mm. I never want somebody to commit to my program because of a timeline or because of fear of like maybe not getting a different opportunity. I want them to feel like they're going to come here and this is the best option for them for whatever reason clicks in their head. Um, my job is to find people I think can produce and contribute on and off the field in my program, give them the platform, the opportunity, you know, give them the best offer I can. And then it's up to them to decide if they're going to accept it or not. And I'm old older, I should say. Uh, so for me, when we get a no from a player we really like, it's easy for me to say, listen, she shouldn't be here. She said, no, it doesn't feel right for her. My assistants who are younger get really disappointed and they're like, we just spent eight months recruiting this player and she's decided to go somewhere else. I'm like, yeah, but she's not supposed to be here. That place felt better than us. That's a reason why she shouldn't be here. It's better for everybody. Um, but that comes with the years of experience where when it's the first time somebody's done that to you, it feels a little personal. It feels disappointing. I'm like, nope, we'll be better off for them not being here, and that's okay. 
and it's still okay because you still might have 100 players which you might be able to select from in the talent pool as well in, in terms of that other perspective but I was going to say to you as you sort of said it there and that process is good because if they don't fit but you've already had that two-week deadline bang they're part of it and then suddenly you're two months into the program and it's not working out and then all the other formalities come into play then that's sort of a process which has really shot you in the foot more or less um, but whereas you let it play out and you have that time there deciding whether it's right fit for you is right fit for each other um, and you're able to have more conversations with them and the more and more you get to know them you're, you're like oh actually we've seen great progress yes they're excelling in this area we're definitely going to have them and then boom at the end of the the process they're like yes i want to come join your program which is a fantastic position to be in but then it's also hard because as you say your assistant coaches there were like well we spent eight months trying to recruit this player it can be a difficult one as well but for you in terms of that approach then do you find you have a lot more success that you're having now by the approach that you have than the deadlines than you've been having if you were to analyze it I think so, because I think, you know, there's a lot of things that you're trying to do all at once when you're running a program, but at its root, you always want people to say that they're enjoying their experience and giving people time to vet out and making sure that this is the right choice. It gives them an ownership over what's happening as well. A clear understanding. I'm a very straightforward. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Um, as long as it's not about somebody else, you know, uh, you know, I'm not going to share details about somebody else's scholarship offers or injuries, those types of things. But when it comes to, you know, the questions that I think everybody should always be asking is, do you think I'm going to be competitive? Do you think I have a chance to start? Do you think, you know, this is the right place for me if I want to go play professionally, like all those different things, you know, I I'll tell you the straight up truth. Well, you know, I think you're going to be competitive in our training environment. I think it's going to be really hard for you to compete to get into our starting lineup. And then that's the player's choice to choose that experience. Mm -hmm. Um, When it comes to the off-field stuff, that's simple because everybody gets the same off-field experience. Everybody's treated as an individual, but, you know, I make a lot of efforts and we put a lot of things in place within our staff to make sure that, you know, it's the, it's the old adage, fair, not equal. Like, Everything can't be completely equal, but we try really hard to make sure everything is fair. So when it comes to off-field, we knock it out of the park. Everybody is treated the same, no matter if you're number one or number 30 on our roster. But when it comes to on-field stuff, we're a competitive team. There's only so much on-field time. There's only 11 starting positions. So if I can be really upfront about where I see you and honest, and sometimes we're wrong. It's better. It's better when I think you're going to be number 30 on the roster, you end up being number 15. That's fantastic. But if I'm trying to pull the wool over your eyes and say, yeah, I think you're going to be competitive right away, but I think you're going to be, you know, on the bottom of my competitive scale, that sets you up for failure in terms of your understanding and where you are and what the experience is going to be. Um, But everybody has that opportunity. So kind of making sure everybody feels well-informed, giving them that ownership of decision with as much information as they can have about what we think of them as a soccer player what the experience is going to be off field. And then that academic side of things that the university gets to produce, it gives a real sense of calm. I think players that are on field and playing generally are happier than those that aren't. But in my experience so far, those players, even though frustrated that they're not on field are overall having a positive experience about what they're doing and what they're contributing to our team and our program here. And that's most important because, you know, I think about my team and my teammates, like I'm not close with certain teammates 20 years from now because they scored the most goals on our team. I'm friends and and peers with them now because we developed this great long lasting relationship and what we experienced and what we went through. So it's almost more important developing that piece of it and making sure that it's understood that the competitive challenge that our program and our our space has challenges you to be better but ultimately it's all those other things that end up meaning more down the line you know i'm not friends and you know you know as silly as it sounds i didn't my husband didn't marry me because I won a conference championship in college. You know, we got to know each other, but I am a different person because of my experience learning and competing to win that conference championship, which is something that parlays into your professional and personal life. Um, So it's really neat, those correlations and what it can do. And it all starts in that recruiting aspect. Mm. 
And that's, that's that's the important thing as well in terms of you know giving the space, the time, understanding who is who, uh, what they want to what they want to bring, what they want to achieve from the program. How can they contribute to the team when they're not on the pitch and maybe on the bench as well? How can they have that impact off the bench? How can they build those relationships? And as you say, as you still have people coming to your wedding and have those relationships which you built from a previous time you want to instill that within your own players for them to have that experience as well but they have to realize that they have to take ownership of that they have to build those relationships and they have to understand that there are going to be different personalities and sometimes just because you know Josie for example is the most competitive player on the team and she wants the best for herself she's trying to push herself does it mean that she isn't someone that you can get along sometimes it is hard to get along with someone because you're a bit off put by them like oh they're a bit up themselves or they're a bit this that and the other no actually they just got a determined mindset and you take that away you get them out you, you might spend an evening going out having some dinner with them you might realize they're a completely different person so that's where the importance of say bridging the team comes together those team activities that recruitment that piece and the excitement of coaching um, and then you can sit back when they're leaving at the end of the, of the program and be like yeah they're all at the bar now or, yeah they're all going out doing this and that's the great thing because they're taking another step on in life but it's great to see them leave together as a collective and therefore they've achieved that forward togetherness beyond what the program is Absolutely. Yeah. One of my, one of my favorite things that I came across when I was a young coach and it's like, you know, you, you can get to a place as a coach where you're like, Oh, I coach soccer and it can feel a little frivolous, right? Like I'm making a living where it's like, there are people who are doctors. There are people who are literally at war in the world right now. Like, like is what I'm doing truly worthwhile in this like existential sense. And uh, somebody told me once they're like, yes, you're, coaching soccer and it can feel very one note and very immediate in the current presence but the reality is is that you're helping teach and develop those that are going to be doctors and that are going to be leaders of industry and that they're going on to these things and you have this wonderful responsibility over the course of their university years to help make them better in a lasting way so your impact while in the immediate is on the field and just this like kind of isolated experience for these young women and for this school. But the reality is, is that hopefully the lasting impact is exponential because these young women are going off for the better with the lessons learned in the environment that you've created to go on and do great things, whether they're staying at home and raising a family or in a C-suite somewhere. Are they taking what you gave them and making things better for themselves and for the people around them because of the experience that they've gone through? Um, and that is that, like I said, big ex existential piece of what we're doing. Can you help other people be better so that they can be better? Um, but it's a really cool part of what we're doing and the, the efforts that you put into coaching full stop, no matter the sport, but especially in soccer, because we all know soccer, football is the best way. Absolutely, I completely agree with you. It's a top sport there. Um, and when it comes down to, say, and, and that approach and that commitment towards driving what soccer is, do you think, say, in 10 to 15, 20 possibly years, do you think that soccer will overtake and be the US's number one sport? Oh, my. Um, maybe. Which is a very waffling answer. But I think there's also reality that there... I, I think soccer is going to continue to explode in this country. I think the men's game and the excitement connected to the MLS and what our national teams are doing, what our players who are playing internationally are doing is really starting to take root in a deeper way than we've seen in the past on the competitive, like the competitive nature of the men's side of the game and on the women's side of the game, there is just this unbelievable thing happening right now where the excitement and passion for the women's game is starting to root and people are starting to recognize the profitable platform that exists mm. and are taking advantage of that, which I think is a huge uh, turn for the game and for its, its root. Um, the NWSL is adding teams in terms of expanding as a league and you see leagues all around the world in the women's game who are starting to fund and produce professional environments for women at not the same level as their men's leagues right now, but at a place where they're selling out the same stadiums. They're bringing in ticket sales. They're bringing in jersey sales. I mean, there's hilarious missteps coming off of this last World Cup where 
but Nike and Adidas missed huge opportunities for jersey sales and things like that because they didn't have an expectation that people were going to buy women's jerseys. And everybody was just like, what do you mean? They sold out in like 20 minutes because you didn't produce enough. You know, so that profitability of the women's game and the recognition of people investing money to make money is a huge change in terms of becoming a number one sport, the the attention and the detail, because ultimately it is it is you you buy and you add to the professional game to make money when you're on that side of it, when you're buying a franchise, when you're trying to produce a team, there is a reality that it is a profit business. People are starting to recognize that it's an untapped market. You can get a professional team at pennies compared to a men's franchise right now. So getting it, you know, you're seeing a lot of professional athletes from all aspects buying ownership stakes in women's soccer teams right now, because the, the risk reward is exponential and it's really cool to see that and like i said i think there's been such great continued momentum like incremental like the like little steps little steps continued pushes from those in the women's game in particular over years and for whatever reason it really feels like the momentum is caught now and it, you know they, there's a term called flywheel where it's like you know it takes a really long time to get it going but then once you do, the momentum keeps it spinning and going and going. And I feel like that momentum hit has caught in women's soccer because of what you're seeing in Barcelona, what you're seeing in the W League in England um, and across the UK. You know, we have two young women that played in, in Welsh leagues here in the state. You know, like it, it's everywhere. Um, and not only the resources and availability for women to play, but the profitability on the business side is just booming right now. And that's why I say maybe. Because when that clicks, you overtake things like baseball. You overtake things like basketball. I don't know about the NFL because it's so rooted. And they're doing, they're really pushing, I don't know if you've noticed, they're really trying to push into an international space mm -hmm. to broaden their fan base. Um, so that's the maybe part to go all the way back to your initial question. But there is a real excitement about that momentum that the women's side has caught and the competitiveness that our men's side is starting to see internationally. Because let's be honest, internationally football is more successful and more competitive than it is here in the states at the moment so when we can have purchase at the highest level americans get excited because we like being good at things mm. yeah it's part of our dna <laughs> we, we're kind of that kid that likes to take our ball and go home if we're not good at it you know we're like oh this isn't cool and we run to something else that we're good at um but we're starting to find that purchase on the men's side and the profitability of the women's side it, it's just going to keep going it really feels like it's it's hit that turning point now I think you make a really good point there as well in terms of, um, you know, that, that growth in terms of the female game, in terms of the investment, in terms of franchises, how that might explode within the future. Um, the differences in terms of the game, that potential catch up to other sports and potentially taking over. Um, and that wider landscape, that wider geographical positioning, just domestically and internationally is so exciting. Um, <clears throat> but it's a point which other coaches perhaps haven't alluded to, which is great because you've extended in terms of the foundations that we built upon. But whilst you're contributing, whilst you're building players for the future, whilst one day the game will be at that point, you can look back and go, yes, you know what, I actually contributed to those levels. And without me contributing almost, you know, this X, Y, and Z and getting players here, perhaps the game wouldn't be here. So collectively, as all the coaches are, they are taking the game forward and they have to do that. And, and that is that forward together without realising for a collective space across the, the US landscape um, for university coaches. But whilst those trends, whilst those changes come into play and say the game does build up and out, you're seeing these franchises get bigger and bigger, do you see your role changing to meet the need of those changing franchises, the change in business scope, the change in the political landscape, etc.? A bit. You know, at its root, no, because my job will always be to help people develop through this vehicle of soccer. Like, that will never change, right? And it can't. Like, if you you know, put the cart in front of the horse, as they say, like, you're, you're just going to stumble and, and you're going to kind of lose your own way. So that piece will never change. But certain things in regards to what my players are looking for will and how I'm helping them more and more, you're seeing young women that want to pursue a professional track and go on to play after our college year. So if you're here at university with me, there's a higher percentage of my team that wants to go and play overseas, that wants to get a trial with an NWSL team. We have a new professional league that's starting here in the United States for women in the coming fall. So getting an opportunity to maybe find that roster. 
um, that piece changes my personal job right now as a collegiate coach because creating those relationships and networks to help them find purchase and give them those opportunities post-graduation becomes more important because it's something that they're looking for more and more. So even going back to our recruiting conversation, finding young women who do want to challenge themselves to go down that path is something that we are excited about and we look for because those are people that are those soccer nerds. They want, you know, they're in it for life and whether they go that route or not is, you know, four or five years down the line, but they have that excitement and that idea that hey, it's possible now because look at this growth, look at all these new teams and these leagues, you know, in the past in the United States, if you wanted to stay home, there were only like eight teams. So, you know, you look at that, it's only 200 players across the entire world that are in this league. Well, now they're adding a 10th and an 11th and a 14th team. So there's more and more roster spots just in that one league. And then you add in all of these leagues around the world that are providing not just living wage, because you used to be able to go overseas and play. They provide housing. They'll give you food or give you money to feed yourself. But that was it. But now these women are earning a wage based on their performance and their value being brought to clubs. Um, and that's a profitability side. Is the women's team, sorry, is the women's team bringing in money? Then we get to pay our players more. And it's a little bit of chicken and the egg. You pay your players more so that the value comes through and then you make more money. But if you put in more money and invest more, you're going to get better players. Like it's a little difficult to know which one comes first. But that's where that momentum is so important. It creates opportunities for my current players to go to Australia, to go to Germany, you know, and play in the Bundesliga, to play in the W League in, in the UK, to play, you know, in Spain. You know, I, I mean, it's just incredible. Like, Lyon has been one of the top women's teams in the world for years now, and they're selling out stadiums, playing against people in the Champions League final. And you can watch that on TV here in the States. I had a teammate that played, that won three Champions League, and during that time, it wasn't streamed or broadcast anywhere. So I literally had to try to find random YouTube links. And it was like this grainy, like somebody had an old cell phone out trying to broadcast the games for people to watch. Uh, now it's just on Paramount Plus yeah. and it's great and it's awesome. So that piece has changed a little bit, you know, to kind of cycle back through a different part of our conversation in what I do. But it's always going to be how do you help people develop and get better through this vehicle of soccer? I love that, and I think that's so important as well. And whilst building upon that, say, you know, there might be a political landscape in terms of, say, let's take Los Angeles, LA Galaxy, for example, right? Only every team within that state or that area, that massive geographical area, they might have three or four universities, you know. Uh, I don't know the geographical uh, landscape of America that detailed, right? But say <laughs> they, they, they have all of, say, um, uh, the, the state that can only produce players and they have their first and total right for those players coming out of all those universities. And say that national club started to recognise that across a domestic basis, would that put you off coaching in a level of club or university that would be part of that type of programme? Or would you want to steer clear of it, for example? Um, wait, sorry, hit me again with that one. I lost you in the sc scope of the question. No, no, that's fine. So say you've got LA Galaxy, right? They're in yeah. a state and that all the universities and colleges in that state can only produce players for LA Galaxy. LA Galaxy oh, have I the first choice of those like, players. Yeah. Similar, similar to the academy system that you guys are more used to as opposed to kind of the Similarly, open yeah. I got you. Um, I don't think so, you know, just in the, the generality of that question. I think there's too much nuance that we don't know to say yes or no uh, immediately. Um, you know, I think there's something wonderful about how broad our current system is and the flexibility that players have. You know, they're not, to put it in a very crude way, owned by, by clubs during their youth they are going through it and then they kind of have to find their own path. And sometimes that gives a lot more power back to the player. Now, that being said, the U S soccer youth system is probably one of the most criticized, you know, and it's, it's, I'm probably a little uh, skewed because I'm in the middle of it. So I hear more of that compared to other countries, but you hear about, you know, the profit to play, to pay to play that's here in the United States and how difficult that can be for certain families, how, you know, the challenges that come with that in terms of development, in terms of consistency, 
where an academy system might benefit some of those criticism of, of our youth development system. Um, you know, I think university here in the States and how our system is set up will always be a little different than that academy set where, you know, the MLS has their homegrown sp spots where if they come up through their academy, they go to uni and then they like enter the pros, they kind of can go directly into, you know, the earthquakes or the, or the galaxy. Um, so maybe there's some sort of middle ground, but I think it's going to be really hard for our youth system to shift that way because, mm -hmm. you know, the cat's already out of the bag, however you want to say it. There's too many people making a lot of money off of youth soccer right now. So to essentially remove that from them, they're not just going to give that up. Uh, so, and that's a very cynical way of looking at it. I think there's really wonderful people doing a great job at the youth level that sometimes we don't talk about here in the States. Um, I've worked at the youth level before. I've had very uh, up and down experiences with it. I've seen the best and I've seen the worst of it. Um, so I'll tell you this, I probably outside of part time and maybe working with the team here and there will not make my full career working at the youth level. Um, but in terms of being at university, I don't think it would adjust anything for me because I think, again, the things that keep me here and make this my pursuit of profession are working with people through soccer to help them get better. And that in kind of this hypothetical that you put at my feet and I've just rambled about for the last two minutes. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, it's fine. Um, probably isn't going to change. Uh, so I'll probably stick with it. <laughs> no, no, it's just an interesting question. I sort of cropped up as we were having a, a discussion. Then it's just oh, interesting to get great, that point. It's a so. great hypothetical. There's so many different avenues on that one. <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. And uh, it's definitely interesting to see where, you know, part of a, a discussion that I have with a good friend of mine who is a coach is how does the future always look for us? How will our roles change? Will we be soccer coaches or football coaches in 10 years' time? How will that differentiate on the yeah. pitch? So, for example, part of his outlook is uh, that we have a, a psychologist who work with a the team. They're very much off the pitch. And as we start to see now, we've got set-piece coaches which work on the pitch. They might work yeah. just on throw-ins. They might work on free kicks, corners, etc. But he's saying in 10 years' time that there might possibly be a coach on a pitch who's a full-time psychologist. So they're coaching psychology on the pitch full time whilst working with the players. So it's interesting to try and keep up with trends in that analysis of the future while sort of instilling what we have now, but always making sure that we're adapting, that we are pushing towards those periods of time. Um, and whilst you have a, a philosophy of football, touching upon those principles and actually getting on to the uh, style of play, how does football look in your mind? What would you want to go and see the most perfect team that is coached by Shannon playing like on yeah. a good day if you were to invite a bunch of guests over and go yeah that's how they play yeah that's it um so there's a really fantastic quote by john wooden and i don't know if you're he's uh, infamous here but it's a basketball coach so i don't know how internationally he's known um but one of his great quotes that i love is if i've done my job as a coach on game day i can put my team out there and sit back and enjoy and just watch them yeah but I'm there, so I might as well throw my two cents in. That's the full quote. Um, and I love that idea. I think, for me, that's the picture of on-field success. Have I developed and taught my team in a way that on game day, they have true autonomy of what they're doing. They're problem solving. They're working through it as individuals, as teammates. The bench is loud and excited. They're invested and connected the whole time. But I am just there as a resource and a tool because they're already in a place where they feel free to go at the game independently. Um, in terms of style of play, I am a very big believer that the my favorite style of play is player driven. So do they feel confident to make decisions and make mistakes? Because, you know, this sounds weird. People always question me when I say this out loud. Soccer is a game of mistakes. And people are like, well, that's pessimistic. I'm like, no, it's not. It's the absolute opposite. Like you are constant. The best players in the world constantly make mistakes. You're either turning the ball over, getting stripped on the dribble. You're getting beat as a defender. You're in the wrong position. You know, even goalkeepers can make a brilliant save, but they parry it out of bounds and they have to face a corner kick then. Like it is a constant game of mistakes and adjustment and then responding to the new current situation. Um, so giving players that freedom to know that they're fine, you're going to make a mistake and it's going to be okay. You just get to move on and continue to play. Mm -hmm. And you're looking for those moments of success. That's why goals are so exciting because it's really hard 
it's really hard to score a goal, to have 11 people collaborate and beat 11 other people that are trying to prevent them from doing that thing to ultimately score is a challenging thing. That's why there's so much celebration and joy around it. And that is the best when a player can just play flexible and free. I'm not one that says, you know, if the 10 gets it, I want it to go to the seven and then it's going to go to the nine. I want them to make the decision. I want that midfielder that's taking the, you know, 10 different looks before they're getting the ball because they know that somebody's already winging out to make that run because it's not prescribed. I want them to read the game and play the game because I think that's the most fun as players. I think that's what they love. And I like coaching that because I don't want to watch 90 minutes of we play it to that person and they play it to this person. Like that's too predictable. It's not as fun. Like the excitement of what soccer is, is you don't know what your opponent's going to do. You, you, you scout and you hope you have an idea, but you don't know. And can our players best them in that moment and giving them that flexibility and that, that freedom of how we play. We have a style of course that we set up and implement, but then on game day, it's kind of up to them. Uh, and that's, that's the most fun. That's, that's what I want to see on game days. And when you have that game day, you have that independence, you have that autonomy, you have the freedom of players, they, they have the confidence to make mistakes, they're making mistakes, but they're achieving those moments of success which you talk about. You're seeing growth within the team, you're seeing the team, you're happy overall with how they play. How do you approach training then? Are you a lot more hands-on in training or a little bit more hands-off that sort of interlinks with match day? Or is it bang, your hands-on in match, uh, training so you can be as much hands-off on match day as possible? Yeah, it, you hit the nail on the head. Um, it, it is funny. I'm a very, like, my vocal presence in training is a lot higher than when we're in gameplay because that's the teaching environment. You can give input and influence on game day, but are you really, like, you want to use it as a teaching platform and, you know, a, a test? Like, okay, we've been working on this thing and it's not working in the game. Why? But... I mean, if you've played the game, you know a coach saying something to you from the sideline. Like, that's not where the real real learning happens. It's a piece of learning, and you, you move on and you take information from the game. But in the middle of the game, to say, hey, this isn't working, let's do this, that's really challenging for players. And, and you can try to give them that, but you want them to be the problem solvers, right? You want them to feel like, hey, I keep trying to take this kid inside. It's not working. I'm going to go out. And that's the learning curve to give them – have you taught them multiple opportunities, multiple ways to think of the game so that they can problem solve in the game? That has to come from them on game day. Um, very little can, in my opinion, come from coach influence in that moment, in that competition, because I can't make your body turn. You have to do those things in split second decisions. But in training, I can, one, set up training situations that create repetition of technical excellence and tactical environment, right? So if this happens, I, I call them visual cues. What's the visual cue here that would lead you to say, oh, which are probably want to play in behind the back line? Well, my teammate is running vertically. Their body position is facing that space. So they don't want it at their feet. They want it in the space in front of them. Okay, great. That's the visual cue. Now, it, as the forward in that scenario, what's the visual cue that you should turn away from them, not present feet, but challenge the space in behind the back line? Well, my teammate just won the ball and they don't have a defender on them right away. So they can pick their head up and look for that moment and see what type of ball. And, you know, what are those visual cues, the, the activities that you set up and how you repetitively communicate and coach within those activities creates habits and develops muscle memory and those visual cues so that in a game they can look at it and say, oh, this is what's presenting. Maybe I'll try this. And as they try those things, if it doesn't work, okay, maybe I should try something else. But again, giving those contextual opportunities and then the variety of solution is something that you absolutely try to present in your training space and that comes through communication and teaching and repetition is huge in terms of learning so getting your voice in there and controlling hey this is how we say it this is the language that we use so that we're all on the same page and it might not be coming from me in my language and we're problem solving it might be coming from your teammate on the field but we're all kind of learning those same things and those same cues so that we can present it on the field collectively. Uh, Cause that's one of the fun things about soccer. You have moments of individual brilliance, but generally it comes from that collective play and coordination, um, which, you know, that's, I think that's why they call it the beautiful game because it's like, Holy crap. Did you just see that? Like we just had 
10 people touch the ball before we scored. Like that's incredible, you know, and it gets exciting. Um, almost as much as when you see one person rip off the ball in the midfield, dribble 60 yards, and then smack one up into the upper 90. Like, there's such a different side of what the excitement in the game gives us. Um, so, yeah, that training environment, you'll see a little bit more vocal presence, a lot more repetition from us as coaches, uh, and even just the types of activities that we put together to help create those scenarios and those learning moments in a game day context. Uh, are really important. We don't do just things frivolously. Sometimes you do things for fun, but that's not frivolous. That's because the game should be fun and you have to bring those things into your environment. Um, sometimes people think it's frivolous. I was like, that's very different. Uh, but it, it is funny because, and that's why when, you know, to go back to recruiting, sometimes when we have recruits on, we love when they can see a training space and a game day space because coaches can be very different from one to the other. Um, mine is a lot more vocal and energized in training and then hopefully on game day I can kind of sit back and enjoy but you have to help because that's the job um now my assistant she's a lot more of a spitfire on the sideline so that's nice because you have that balance you've got that coach that can like really jump and get out there and put her voice there and I just let her go sometimes sometimes I have to reel her in but <laughs> for the most part it's a good balance I've been in that same position, so I've had assistants who have played games to a much higher level than me, and they still play, and, and some of them, you know, a, a lot more versed when it comes to referees and, and uh, officials, um, and they typically deal with the officials a lot more than me. And I'm like, oh, no, they're off dealing with them again. And sometimes that's a good thing because they're happy to approach it, but sometimes you do have to rein them back in because uh, I have one very good assistant, but he would lose his head with the officials straight away, um, yeah. and he would challenge every question, like, oh, not again. And sometimes I have to play the very good cop to try and settle things back down and be like, this doesn't need to go any further after today's game. But uh, it is good when you can sort of have that approach in terms of training. And I, I love what you say, um, and I love how you capture these. So contextual opportunities and variety of solution. Because when you sort of have that language, that terminology, you're providing an opportunity to make mistakes, but you're, you're providing the problem-solving elements, the solutions, uh, scenarios, how players can replay that sort of situation and then look at right i can't do option a but can i do option b if that doesn't work what's option c um and then the stats give them a lot more cues which they can as you say build into that uh, muscle memory whereby they can then recollect what they've done in training apply it into the game and then you can see those moments of success and that transition between it um and it's really exciting when you see a player pull that off you get to see that sort of outcome from training to game and see them do it in a uh, competitive environment against another team which is really exciting but when you structure training sessions do you typically set a session up in terms of right this is the warm-up this is the main activity this is maybe the ssg at the end and then we might capture some moments or objectives at the end of it and that's how typically all your sessions look or do you have a wide variety to capture all those solutions those opportunities by doing very different delivery sessions across say a course of say two months three months for example yeah, there, there's a lot of variety, and it all depends on what your goal from that session is because, you know, the the simplest, straightforward session is here's this thing that I want to teach the team. And especially when it comes to in context of gameplay, sometimes it's, um, I think, a very effective structure. You have your warm-up, you have your technical piece that's going to lead into the small picture. So can you isolate, hey, this is what we're working on. Maybe it's you know, a transition moment. So when we win the ball, this is how we respond to it offensively, right? Um, and then you can put it into the larger game and let them see if they can find those moments and find those repetitions within gameplay, right? So that's a really straightforward teaching structure um, when it comes to like small and specific moments in the game or, or general moments in the game. But then you get to broader concepts that teams also need to learn. So we have days that are all built on, can we drive the competition level? Can we put them out there and compete? And sometimes that looks like really intense, really challenging things. And it can be technical. It could be 4v4. It can, it can be a lot of different things. But everything we do is going to be competitive. And we're going to score everything. And we're going to demand that you attack and value every little thing. And sometimes those competitive sessions can have a silly game in there where it's like, okay, you're going to you know play bucket ball where it's like you have to juggle it 20 yards and then get it. And can you compete? as a player, as equally in that as you are in front of goal. Like, those are the true people who are competitive, aren't just good soccer players. They want to win, and they want to be the best at everything you put in front of them. We could put a game of tic-tac-toe out on the field, and they're going to care if they win or not. Um, so it all just depends on what you want to take out of the session. So sometimes teaching can be a lot more linear because you want to try to simplify the complexities of our games and make it uh, an environment where the players can – 
retain what you're giving them. That repetition becomes so important. Are you creating repetition so that it is becoming a pathway, a neural pathway in your brain? Like, oh, I understand. I see where this technique, why we did this technical work, because being able to properly texture a ball to play in behind is really important. Oh, I understand that we're doing this activity so that I can see the transition moment and the timing of when we release our runs. And now I'm going to texture that ball in properly. And then you put it in a game so that you're not giving them the moment. They have to respond to the moment within the flow of play, right? That's a very linear thought process in learning and teaching, but there aren't just those specifics when it comes to teaching and learning our game. That's why it's really fun. Are you competitive? Are you uh, responding to chaos? Can you create high intensity moments so that in a game they feel very calm? You know, there are all these different things that you can layer in that might create different opportunities and different reasons to structure training sessions in different ways. Sometimes we just roll out the ball and play because you know what? We need that. We need them to just kind of turn their brain off and let you play. No lessons today. Just go and play the best soccer you can. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and those are just as fun. You know, there's different values and different products from both of those environments. Um, but having that, I like to call it the tool belt, having those things in your back pocket so it's not just one note. You know, my players don't show up and say, oh, this is what it's always going to be today. You know, we're always going to warm up. We're always probably going to do something technical because it doesn't matter how brilliant you are. If you're not technically good on the ball, you're not going to be able to execute. Um, but, you know, every we generally have a framework over a, a course of time but the flexibility to kind of change those pieces to make sure that we're attending to what the team needs at that moment. Um, and it's just also fun as a coach because you don't want to show up and do the same thing every day. Like that's redundant. Um, uh, it, it's great. And it's fun to challenge yourself too, because you can get very comfortable doing things one way and running a certain session in a certain set, but making sure that you're looking at different ways going to the convention to learn and see different people and, and how they're doing things. My staff, I challenged my staff to connect with a different coach in the country that they're going to go and just observe and be around their program for a couple days because everybody does it differently. And it might not be your best way, but the more tools you can put in your tool belt, the more things you can pull out of your back pocket, you never know how that's going to help you teach your team or help you develop your team in the future. But if you don't have those tools, you definitely aren't going to be able to use them. Um, so it's really fun to have that variety. So definitely more on that side than just the one straight structure. And what, what, would you say the same for your, say, program, your style of play, your principles? Well, maybe the principles as a foundation, but the way that you play might differ from year to year. So therefore, I'm not saying I've been a head coach for a university for three years and I've known you for three years. We've come up against each other and in year one and year three now, where I'm looking back going, yep, she played the same in year one. She played the same in year two. Do you expect that same difference in terms of the foundations and principles that you have and tweaking how you play? Or is it more of continuously changing every year a built on your principles? You no, know, there's a lot more stability. So the style of play, and, and maybe it'll change in the future, but, um, you know, because I might change. I might learn something new that adjusts how I think our style of play. Our style of play is our foundation and our root. But when we come up against opponents, there's new information and new context, right? Mm -hmm. So we have this style of play, but how that implements against a team like UNC, who is hopefully internationally known for their dominance and how prolific they are, they are very good compared to maybe a team that is considered a lower level than us um, is going to look very different playing against a team that's more possession based compared to more, more direct base. Maybe there's, they have more speed, less speed, like there's different ways. That's where we look at tactical adjustments. So it's not that our style of play or our foundation changes. It's how we implement on game day that might shift and change depending on our opponent. And that could change from year to year. We have certain people in our league that are very similar from year to year because their staff has been there for decades. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not an exaggeration. We literally have a couple coaches in our league that have been there since they started the program, um, which is really neat. And then we have two schools that just changed coaches. So they have a brand new coaching staff. So we don't know what we're going to see from them this uh, in the coming year. But that's why scouting is important. And you watch the film and you do those things. But if you have a strong foundation of how you play and that style, I believe you can put it into any formation and based on your personnel, you might choose a different formation one year because your roster looks like this and these players are stronger. So we're going to play in a four, three, three with a dual six and, you know, high pressing wingers as opposed to reserved wingers because of the strength of our personnel. 
Now we might be playing against somebody that says, you know what? They play in a two front instead of a lot of people in the States play in a three front. Let's go into a three back because we can, but our style of play doesn't change. We're just using a different formation to implement it based on the context of our opponent. Um, and those are the fun things uh, in our fall season because you get to look at it and play a little bit more like, okay, we're just going to attack them and do the, like, this is who we are and it's going to set us up for success. Or do we need to make an adjustment to set ourselves up for success? Do we make a personnel adjustment? Do we move into a two front because this player is coming out of nowhere? So we want to promote that as opposed to playing with a lone striker, like all those different things, but our foundation of style of play never changes because that's what gives us that, uh, connection, the understanding, the fluidity. That's why they talk about teams that have played together for years. They understand how they play and what the norms are. And then you can adjust or deviate from there in a way that is more controlled than if it's just like, well, this year we're going to play direct. Next year we're going to play possession style. This year we're going to play with two center backs that just lump the ball forward and hope we can chase it down. Like this year we're going to fan out and the goalkeeper is going to play and we're going to build out from our own end line. Like, you know, it's just too chaotic when you create that consistency, it gives you the opportunity to provide variety to your players. Um, which is a little bit probably uh, counterintuitive, you know, to hear, you know, like, Oh, if you just are chaos, there's more variety. Well, no, like great foundation of what we're doing provides successful variety opportunities because now the players have a trust and an understanding of what we're doing, no matter the circumstance and they can play and create within that system. I love that. And I think, again, you're in the most perfect position because as much as it's easy to have that context to say, all right, you haven't adapted, it's easy to have the foundations and principles to build upon that year upon year. But you're creating that stability. You're creating a foundation where you can make little tweaks. You're developing players. uh, You're bringing in different styles of play at different periods of time. And you have those adjustments. But it is a perfect position because say you're somewhere now for three to five years, you've got to year five. You might have five different head coaches across different universities, which have all changed. So therefore, Mm -hmm. all those different styles philosophies principles of play have all changed the style of players which they brought in have changed the amount of players you managed against and all those different contexts means that you've provided a lot of foundation but you've adapted to the teams that you've come up against and therefore you don't actually need to adapt year after year and have a complete different style of play so actually you're in the most perfect position to create stability whilst learning and progressing at the same time which to some people on paper that might not look like it but realistically on the pitch what you deliver how that training goes is very different and tells a different story so it is the most perfect position to be in yeah and but that's the fun right like we're trying to create consistent you see you're trying to create a stable environment for these young people to learn in, but it's always changing. You're bringing in, whether it's a coaching change, whether it's a division change, a conference change, like there's all these changing aspects of their world. And you're again, asking them, you're challenging them. Great. Here are your circumstances. Make it better. Cool. This has changed. The goal is still the same. Make it better. Make yourself better. Challenge yourself in new ways. And you know, that's where our game mirrors the world. And that's why I think a lot of people end up coaching because they understand that the lessons learned through sport take into real life. Your ability to handle change and conflict, challenge, like small or big, is absolutely, I mean, I think there's a reason, there. there's a wonderful statistic here in the United States. A lot of, I don't know the number, so I'm just going to talk in generalities, most of a lot of the women who are in C-suite positions, so leadership positions in industry and businesses in the United States are held by women that played collegiate athletics, not just soccer, but like athletics in general. Mm -hmm. And I wholeheartedly believe that that's because you're learning lessons in the sport that those that don't play sport don't take with them into the real world. Those conflicts, those challenge moments, how do you make something better while being you know, dealing with difficulty, dealing with people, all those different things take off. And I think that's why people end up coaching. You know, there's a lot of different reasons, but for the majority, I think a lot of us really love what we do because we see how it affects people in their broader life, not just, oh, I've helped them kick a ball better. Cool. Like, (laughs) that's one thing. But like, when you see a young woman, you know, I had had a, a former player of mine. It wasn't when I was a head coach. It was when I was an assistant coach. Um, connect with me recently and talked about something that happened while we were working together 
And she's like, you know, I went into my year end review and uh, essentially asked for a raise to make the story yeah. short. And she's like, what we did and what we went through and how you helped me during then absolutely gave me the confidence to sit down in front of my boss and say, this is who I am. This is the work that I've done. I believe my value warrants this amount of money. Mm. And she got that raise and she, you know, wonderfully because she didn't owe me this at all, reached back out and shared that with me. And those are incredible things. Those are things that as a coach, you're just like, holy cow, look at this impact I'm having on this, this person's life. Not just cool. We won a championship when we work together as a soccer team, like it direct, directly changed her professional life, that lesson learned and that growth and development that she had while she was working with us during that time. Those are the really cool things that I think keep people in the game. I think draw people to the profession in itself, not just a love for the game, but coaching as a whole, no matter the sport, like those things exist. Um, and I think that's why I've stayed in it as a profession, because, you know, this is hard. <laughs> like, it is a hard life. It, the ups and downs, the challenges that we face as coaches, there's a reason why a lot of people leave the profession. Um, but those that stay in it, they have kind of those deep rooted reasons why they love it. And that that value and what they're doing, that that belief of what they're contributing, I think is a big reason most people stay in it for longer periods than some that step out of the profession. because. Um, there is just this great give back when you have those moments where you feel like you're having high impact for individuals. Absolutely, I'm completely with you there as well. And uh, again, you can see the impact on individuals' lives that you've had, not just by winning those championships, but by the, the confidence that they've been able to have, by that negotiation skill, that approach to conflict which you have as well. And that's mm -hmm. what I alluded to uh, with my assistant manager. And I, I think that's what I say is the experience that they have within the game is most valuable to me as a coach, uh, most valuable, valuable in terms of what they take away because they do have those takeaways from those conflict with referees, with the officials, with opposition coaches, and then they understand how how to manage it they understand different moments of the game which is really important to address that and for the younger players to really understand well you can't actually let that slide because that was a foul there you have to actually challenge it to get maybe mm -hmm. the reaction towards it so it's those little things where you might call them street smarts for players to take away because they might learn when and where to get a foul how to get the referee to react to certain situations how to get the opposition player to get a yellow card and sometimes that's not always the right way to coach the game but sometimes they're little street smarts which you need to take away because if you get a foul and bang, you got a free kick, you go and score from it, and it leaves your team getting three points at the end of the day. You've contributed towards that win, which monumentally might have a lot more success towards your team. And it depends what personality style you have as a player and what you want to take away from it. But that's where coaching comes into different plays and whether you problem solve, whether you create a solution to that, whether your team is, is struggling to get into the game. So how does that transition uh, in terms of that recovery come into play? Are you getting overplayed? How, how does that come into play and how do you build upon your players? And that's where the excitement of coaching comes from. And certainly when you get to work with a players get the bridge into that experience uh, get to provide them with those solutions and how that looks on the pitch and those transitions seeing that growth those moments of success bridging together a, a valuable program towards these individuals and uh, doing such a wonderful job which is really insightful yeah no i think it's true and i'll, I'll, I'll throw a hot take at you because this is one that my my players from uh international spaces but especially the uk struggle with so i'm a big believer that we we don't harass and yell at the referees so my players coming from the UK, coming from England, really struggle with that. Mm. One, it's part of our rules here in the college system. You can get carded and kicked off even just for saying like, I mean, you're not allowed to talk to them at all here in the States. It's in the rules. Um, but it's a big thing in, in, within our youth game. And, you know, you've seen it professionally. There is just a culture in soccer and football where referees are just brutally harassed and are abused. In, in some ways. And there's a good natured piece to it. Like there's a part of the culture of the sport where if you have a good rapport with the referee and it's done in a respectful way, like I think there's a good amount of banter that you can have with an individual if there's that understanding, but it crosses a line, right? Mm -hmm. And you hear about these, these referees getting death threats and these different things. And, and I get it. Like sometimes you make mistakes and you screw some things up and that's where it comes from. That passion, that commitment, that investment comes out in a terrible way. Sometimes when a referee makes a mistake, but my players aren't allowed to attack or speak poorly to our referee crew. Um, and that is very different than some of my peers because some of my peers will go after referee. And don't get me wrong. I have my moments. Like there have been times on the sideline where I'll feel myself like, ah, oh, you got to pull it in because that's, you know, you're trying to, 
<laughs> project the same thing you're asking of your players. Um, but that's one of those differences for me, which I know is not the norm in our sport at all. I just believe these people, you know, these people, these men and women that step into that role, they don't show up thinking, you know what I'm going to do today? Screw up this game for everybody. They don't. But that's how we treat them. We treat them like they're purposely doing things wrong. And I'm like, that's just terrible. No one's ever gotten something. No one's ever looked at a referee and said, that was rubbish call, bleep, 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 bleep. And the referee said, you know what? You're right. I'm going to change my mind. We're going that way now. Like, it just doesn't happen. Uh, so just, again, how do you treat people kindly? How do you give them the benefit of the doubt that they're trying their best, even when they screw things up royally, because we've all been there when they've done that, um, you know, and how do you, through frustration, control yourself and still look at somebody and treat them with humanity, even when you're the most mad at somebody you've ever experienced in your life? Because we've been there. We lost, uh, or we, we tied a game it, with six seconds left my first season here when we were still trying to find our first win as a D1 program, first win as a staff, and with six seconds left, they call, you know, the ref center called a PK. And was I frustrated? Did I believe the call was accurate? No, but did I MF the referee as they were leaving the field or chase them down screaming at them? No, because what benefit is that going to do and what kind of an example is, is that showing? to these young people in terms of how you treat others that are working together and, and trying to do a hard thing. Uh, there is a reality that, you, like you mentioned, you have to be learn where the level of squeaky wheel exists. You can't just be passive and let things happen to you. Uh, but I think there's a way to do that while still holding a level of respect for how you <laughs> interact with those individuals. And I know that's not the norm uh, in our space. I've had this conversation with a few of my peers. They're like, yeah, I'm not doing things that way. I was like, that's why you're you and not me. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that's uh, you. You you've you've hit the nail on the head there, and it's quite ingrained within the UK culture. So uh, that's why I always leave my assistant managers to deal with the officials because I I, I believe that I've built up a very good skill set where I can switch off from moments. And as much as I might feel rage, I might just not. I might not show it. I might not allow it to come out. But people are like, "Why aren't you getting angry?" I'm like, "Well, I am, but what's the point? I'm not going to argue with the referee because yeah. I know it's not going to benefit you control me." Control it. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. why the assistants have always dealt with it. Because I'm like, well, if that's what you want to deal with, you crack on. Um, but I was like, the referee's made their decision. There's no point arguing with it. So, um, But it is very ingrained. And that's why when I coached at under 18s level, so under 18 sits under the seniors and you want to progress from under 18s into the senior squads. Um, and so typically in terms of UK culture, you spend a match day then, you know, going back to the clubhouse, drinking, spending the rest of the day at the clubhouse. And I'm like, that's not for me. Bang. As soon as the game's over, I want to recap mm -hmm. with players, maybe spend half hour with them and bang, I'm off then. And that's it, because then the players might stay at the club. They might continue to have drinks. I'm like, not for me. So that's part of the culture yeah. which is in play. But what you might see is a lot of players attacking referees, especially on the senior level uh, here in the UK. And that's one of the reasons which I can't stand coaching at senior level. Got no aspiration to coach there, because that is very much the culture that is ingrained. Attack the referee, put them on the spot. And I'm like, I have refereed. It's the worst place to ever be when things aren't going the yeah. right way, because you're on the middle of the park, then you're walking off the pitch, there's people having a go at you, you're like, what for? What? What? Why? Because I've helped you out referee a game when maybe no one else wanted a ref, or there's a lack of shortages mm -hmm. of ref, etc. So that is part of the game where I love being at the youth level because yes, you do get referees, you're still gonna have coaches attack them, etc. At times, but you get less of it than at senior level. But when you sort of the game can be detoxified and has an opportunity to move away from that then that's why I want to really remain at youth level because it is about player development. You don't have referees at every game all the time. So sometimes, you know, coaches might uh, ref one half each or they might call decisions between them, etc. And typically, from my experience, that works a lot better than having a referee at the high levels. Um, but that's because mm -hmm. we have a shortage of referees who can't referee every game here in, the US, in, in Wales, for example. But that's why the youth level is where it's at because it's more enjoyable than going back, having these typical cultures on a match day at senior levels, mm -hmm. where it's drinking, where it's attacking the refs, they're having a go. Not for me. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's the interesting thing. And, and it, it, you mentioned there, there's a referee shortage here in the States as well, at all levels. Um, and I think it's because of that, because there's this interesting thing. I don't know why people can't connect like, oh, parents have to be better players have to be better but if you as a coach are behaving in a way where you're screaming at somebody and treating somebody with disrespect how can you look at other people in the space and ask that of them you know and i think that's why you're seeing the shortage because who wants to put up with that nonsense they're not paid enough it's a brutal job 
in a sport that you love, like who wants to go out and get abused for two hours on your Sunday? Mm. Um, so I think that it's, it's, it's a good recognition on your part. Like, listen, I get it. It's a part of the system, but I'm not going to be a part of that. And that's great because we all have to find our own way. And sometimes you can get stuck. Like you said, this is how it's done as opposed to like, no, this is how I'm going to do it. And these are the reasons why. And I think those are coaches that end up with great longevity and that, you know, that authenticity that people respond to, because if you are faking it or you're trying to be somebody that you're not and you don't believe in, sooner or later, somebody sees through that. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And and that's why it's about working with people, having those personalities, really developing on situations where they can take the, the moments of success away and really have the opportunity to be good people, to have those relationships, to understand that you don't attack refs, you don't attack coaches, you appreciate the game and the time that has been put mm -hmm. in. And those sort of moments sort of relate to golden seed moments. So you can really say something to a player and they might hang on to that for the next five years, six, seven and beyond further in life. So that's where those moments of success come in because you can really highlight with a player what they've been able to do during a game during training and that's a golden seed moment where they can be like oh do you know what i'm actually really good at that because shannon said i've got a lot of confidence so i remember presenting once uh, when i was in, in high school and i had to present a business plan as a business study student um and i had to present it to two companies and one of them said at the end well you're really good at presenting and i took that away because i never i i i was always happy to do it but i never realized i was happy enough to be so confident where they're like yeah, normal, natural presenter. And that's why I really built upon that. And that was something like, you know, 10 plus years ago. And I still remember mm. that. So those little golden yeah. seed moments are so important for the players. And when you have a time to deliver it, when it comes in that terminology and how you deliver it, especially during those conversations. Well, I think that's, I like that term golden seed moment. I haven't, I don't know if I've come across that before, but the recognition of how much of an impact something small, so small, mm. and you referenced it in a positive sport, but as a coach being very careful and understanding that you can also have those seed moments that can impact somebody negatively in a way that you had no intention to, and being very cognizant of that and having the understanding and the value of how you approach and being very thoughtful, how you give criticism and give feedback, because as much as a small moment can soar somebody, a small moment can also wreck somebody and you might do it, not even know it. And that person is in the tank for a month because they're not willing to come and speak to you because it's hard to look at somebody and say, Hey, you said this and it hurt me, especially if you're in a position of power. So really having that reverence and that understanding of how much impact, even the simple moments a coach can have on a positive and a negative, I think is so important. And I think a huge thing that I've learned from being younger to being an older coach because you get reference, right? You're like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that that had that impact on you, whether it's a positive or negative. So you have those kind of touch point learning moments of how we do things and making sure that we're being thoughtful and thorough about our approach and what we do. Mm. Absolutely. And, uh, and again, that relates to where you might have the young players uh, looking at those influences. So they might see their coaches naturally abusing referees. They see their parents, they see the sidelines. And that's why they end up naturally to win over a period of time. And because I was never yeah. like that towards the referees, my players were never like that. So if one ever questioned and they were young, they were 11 or 12, so they're starting to question a little bit. But they knew automatically as soon as they questioned the referee, I'd be like, right, OK, you, you're opportunity to learn here because you're 11 and 12, but there's a way that you ask it. And they're making sure, and they'd look to me and they would understand that there was a time and place and how you were able to do it. So it was about instilling those lessons and developing a culture whereby I was able to reflect the actions and behaviours that I expected and wanted to see from my players, which they really took away and then reflected upon the pitch within their own learning process, which they were able then to take away through those observations. Yeah, and it's a big... Uh, line here, right? Culture is what you allow, right? So like you said, it's it's one thing to say, this is what we want our team to be. This is what we want to do with our behavior. But the reality is, is if you say, hey, we're not going to abuse the referee, but then you allow somebody on your bench those moments without addressing it, nothing's ever going to change. That's not going to root. But creating that consistency, addressing mistakes that happen, you know, because like I said, like I mentioned, I have players that come over from the UK and they're used to that banter. They're used to that back and forth with the referees and helping remind them like, hey, you're not allowed to do that here. And we also don't treat people disrespectfully. So like you have to find the right balance. You have to find the right way. But making sure they know like it's OK. It's OK to make that mistake. I'm going to help remind you that that's not how we do things, because creating that consistency of what you allow in your space is what roots and what creates that continuation. Right. It's what creates that momentum that we've talked about, like, this is how we do things and continued behavior perpetuates that.
and making sure that the example and what they're seeing is consistent with what you're saying, uh, I think sets the tone for everybody because mm-hmm. it's it's not just this is what I want to do. It's what are people following through with? Absolutely. I completely agree with you there. And um, I like that, you, you, you know, you touch upon how people approach that, how to be a good person, how to reflect upon things, um, how to support them in a scope where they can learn from it. Um, but whilst you come into a new year and, and it, it, it can sound, again, uh, cheesy as if you will, because you might set new goals for the year. Um, and so, you know, new me, new person, new outlook, da, 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 right. But when it comes to a new year, do you set yourself objectives? Do you set yourself goals for the year? Yeah, I think objectives is the word that I would use more so than goals. I think goals are great. And I think, uh, you know, you can get into semantics like crazy, but objectives are very straightforward to me. This is a thing I'm going to do and I'm going to go and I'm going to do it. And and maybe it's not that simple because I'm a big believer that it's it's all about the try, right? Like I'm going to attempt to do this to the best of my ability or I'm going to push myself forward. As a coach, it's a little more straightforward because my objectives and the things I get to do are pretty fixed. Um, as an athlete and then our on-field performance, it's not, there's so many variables. So, so yes, I have goals. Yes. I have things that I look at on field and I say, we're going to score more goals. We're going to concede less and we're going to try to get to this position at a minimum um, of league play based on who we are, our projected development, what I think is going to be competitive, right? You always want to use the word goals to be just out of reach, but reasonable, like, you know, I shouldn't look at my team and say, hey, we're going to win the national title this year. One, because we're not allowed to during the transition period. Um, But two, it's probably out of our reach in terms of what we can do. But can we compete for the top end of our conference? Absolutely, we can. And then it's up to us to see how far we can push that. Um, For me, in terms of objectives, I'm a big believer. You know, I love the name of your podcast, The Reflective Coach, because I think a lot of how you go about objectives and your goals is about reflecting backwards and saying, this is what I've done and this is where I am right now. Where can I push myself and where do I want to go with my own development and how I'm challenging myself and my team? You know, I mentioned my staff, I'm, I, you know, I give them tasks. Hey, I want you to challenge yourself, reach out to a coach that you've never spoken to before and ask if you can go and shadow the, their program for a couple of days. They, they, they weren't allowed to just call their buddy that they knew. They had to expand their coaching network look at somebody that maybe they admire or has a program that they're curious about and try to make contact. Cause my experience is when you've reached out and asked those questions, most coaches are like, yeah, sure. Sounds good. Come on over. Um, you know, and then the same thing for my players, like, where have you been? What have you done? Great. Where do you want to go? All right, great. Where can I question and push you to challenge yourself even further? Because one of my process with the players is what do you want to do? And then how can I use my creativity and experience to say, that sounds great. What about this? And can I give them another level of question, another level of push to say, yeah, that looks awesome. It might be a little safe. Like you say you want to do this. I think you're going to do that and it's going to be easy. What if you did that and then you reached for that piece of it? Um, And the cool thing about that is there's so much variety and ease to apply to every individual because it's not this is what I want you to do. It's what do you want and what are you trying to pursue? What avenues? And then how can I challenge you to make it bigger, broader, sometimes more specific, Mm -hmm. right? Because we've all had those players that are like, well, I want to get better. That's not specific at all. Like better how? Um, Sometimes you have to help them narrow. Sometimes you have to help them broad, but it's always, can you help them look at that next level? Um, You know, for my staff, we went through a huge growth through these first two years. So individually I'm asking ourselves to get better because I'm doing the same thing. Um, But as a staff, we're looking at like, okay, on field, how do we, like we just had a conversation, uh, like on field in your training technique, I want you to think about using a lower register when you're talking to the broader group because studies have shown that it carries further than a higher pitch voice and people respond calmer. You can literally say the same thing with the same volume, same speed, all those things. But if it's a lower register, you respond calmer than a higher register voice. So can you technically work on that? Um, For one of my other assistants, she's really good at setting up activities and running a good activity, but she's not excellent at coaching individuals within those activities yet. Broader picture balanced with the smaller picture. Um, 
you know, so everybody around me, I'm trying to say our, our athletic trainer on the medical side, can we be more consistent on certain things? Our strength coach, this is what I want us to focus on improving this year um, in terms of uh, pointed development. And then for myself, I like, you know, it's hard. It's hard to receive feedback. But, you know, at the end of the season, right away, I ask, what can we be doing better as a program, as a team and myself as a coach? Where are things that and sometimes you got to take it with a grain of salt because they don't have all the information. So, well, I want us to do this thing. I'm like, well, you don't have all the information. We can't just give you, you know, 10 pairs of cleats. That's not budgetarily or responsible. Mm -hmm. Right. But uh, can you take feedback and say, oh, OK, I can see the grain of truth there. I'm going to take some time to really reflect back and see if there's a way I can develop or expand upon that skill to make it better based on what they're giving back to me. Sometimes you make mistakes and they hold those to truths. Well, you know, coach didn't do this one thing that one time. You need to be better at that. No, I made one mistake. That's okay. Um, but that's where that 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 objective, like it, it's it's all under that gaze forward together. That's not just my players. That's everybody, right? Because if we're getting better, we're helping our players get better. Um, so as broad as that is and as general as it is, it will always be how are we going forward. And every piece of my world, I'm looking at and evaluating, reflecting on and saying, okay, this is what we've done. This is where we've been. How do we make it better? Because if you want to achieve better results, you have to do something better than what you've done in the past. You can't just keep doing what you've done and expecting something to get better in a result. Because one, that's just illogical. But also we are in a professional space where our ultimate test of result is putting ourselves out on a field against an opponent who's trying to prevent us from being successful. You know, in other realms of profession, you get to achieve and work and do something and it exists. And that's the end. That's why we're crazy. We literally get to work and try to develop and produce something. And then we throw it out onto a field and say, I hope we're better than that team. We might not be, they might beat us today after all the work that we've done. Um, so there's that uncertainty and that challenge in it. And that's why the continued progression is so important because you're never going to be, uh, I worked with a, uh, a sports psychologist and a, a youth psychologist that used to talk about the hot mess uh, graph because everybody thinks of success as like that straight line, but really it's a hot mess. It goes up and then it comes down and then it goes up again and then you get injured and then it goes up and then you have a grandparent die. Like there's never a straight line. It's can you progress forward? Um, so I just ran all over the place on you, but hopefully it gives you a little insight. You can tell we're in that like forming <laughs> stage of our year where we're still like reflecting, pulling in pieces and whittling down to make it accessible to the players. But my brain is that hot mess right now where I'm still kind of consuming everything and figuring out what is the most important for us to focus on as we move forward. <laughs> no, no, I really love that. And I really love that in-depth detail, that insight in terms to it. And um, as you touch upon those sort of uh, goals, but into objectives and how you've uh, gone into detail on that, I love uh, because the next part of that question was, um, uh, what about big, big goals? What about big objectives? And you've touched upon it there. How can you make them bigger? How can you expand it? How can you push towards the next level? Um, and that is something that is labeled as a BHAG, so bad goals. So big, hairy, audacious goals. And this was a, a, a sort of theory uh, devised by Jim Collins and uh, Jerry Paras in Built to Last 1994. So it's about looking at maybe audacious goals for, say, 10 to a 30 year period. So, um, and that is great for, uh, you know, uh, say an athlete, they might come in for three years, but how can you set a goal for the next 10 years whereby you might already start talking about, you know, having your own house, having a marriage, maybe children. They're like, whoa, 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 I'm only 13, 14, 15. And that's just from some of the conversations that I have with the kids that I teach. I'm like, well, yeah, but this will turn around very quickly. You will be at that point before you realize it. And all these conversations, you will hear me having these coming into your head at these points when these moments come around. And it's only so true. So when you can work on, on big audacious goals, I think there's so much aspiration within that. I think you have to have such a vision. You have to be committed towards that. You have to be willing to learn to develop on and off the field towards it and i think those who've got big audacious goals are a lot more forward thinking um, and visionary than those who might not have it and therefore you might have a lot more push a lot more commitment a lot more outlook a desire to, and all those sort of attributes that contribute towards it in terms of someone who doesn't so it's a really interesting scope with those who are very much willing to to have those big goals and those who are like well maybe not yet but what about these smaller goals so it's definitely interesting playing about how you can work with those individuals and then how the scope of that work is really then interesting as you get to work with them even further 
Yeah, it, and there's a wonderful, uh, it's called the Stockdale Complex. I don't know if you've come across that no. that term, but Victor Frankl, and it's right in that scope of the book you just referenced. And there's another one uh, called Good to Great, that if you liked that one, it, it actually like pulls and references it. It's almost like it, some people call it the sequel. Um, but it, it talks about that. And the Stockdale Complex is literally what we spoke about at the beginning of this call, right? Can you be focused on the present? and optimistic about the future because sometimes when you focus on the present and you get into the weeds right it's it's the trees amongst the forest the forest amongst the trees all those different analogies that that you hear and all these different but it's that concept of can you have a true rooted base in reality and still have this great big audacious goal this optimistic purview of i know that i'm here i know these are the realistic challenges that i am facing my current circumstances, the challenges that lay ahead of me, and I'm still going to shoot for that target and challenge myself and say, I could get there one day, but can you live in the roots and go through it while still on track, while you're only making those tiny gains, right? Like, okay, this year, maybe we make, you know, maybe we get five yards and the next year, next year we get five miles. Sorry, American, uh, uh, metric systems and things um but but you know it's it's that consistency of understanding and having that rooted realism this is what i am right now while still looking and saying this could potentially be there and that's where i'm headed if i stay the course because when you get to those years where you're only progressing those five yards or those small increments people deviate they say oh, it's not working or it's not working as fast as I want it to. So they completely change. They veer off of their value course and they go for the easy answer. They go for the immediate, right? But it ultimately doesn't get them to that big audacious goal. It veers them off and they end up somewhere else. And they're like, oh, why didn't I get a chance to be there? I'm like, well, because you didn't stick with what you thought was going to get you there in the first place. You didn't have the patience to say, this is what I believe is going to get me there. And I'm going to stick with it no matter what. Because sometimes... Things challenge you in ways that are hard. I've had to remove players from my team, which is so counter to my individual want of professional. Like, I want to help everybody. But I'm also responsible for taking care of my team and program. So I give people more chances than my peers think I should um, to course correct, to try to help them, to try to help them learn, develop, and, and get on board with my team's goal and expectations. And there have been a couple moments where I've had to say, I'm sorry, you ha you, you've you shown that you're not willing to do this and I have to take care of my team over your individual care right now. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard, but it's staying true to the overall vision. This is what I value and this is how I'm going to do things. And I believe it's going to get my program to an ASUN title. That's our, our league. If I deviate from those values and allow behaviors to exist counter to that, to make things easier for myself, or to, you know, do I just play bang ball instead of trying to develop our style so that I can get a few more goals right now? Like, yeah, I might get a little bit more immediate feedback and victory and different things. I might feel a little better because I'm not having that hard conversation with this player. I'm not making the hard choice as a coach to remove an individual for the betterment of the team space, but it's not going to keep me on that path, right? So can you live in that? that Stockdale paradox. Can you live in the weeds, the realities of what you're facing, the challenges ahead of you and stay the course for that big audacious goal? I think that's the name of the game. I think that's what we try to do. And my responsibility as the leader of the program, because the players are working on a shorter time frame, getting them to buy into the broader program development is my job because their job is to elevate in the four seasons that they have with my program as much as they can in that short time world. To them, it feels like huge time. We know, being older, that it's a very short window. Can they, as individuals, do as much as they can? And can I, as the program lead, make sure that that efforts stay on course with where the program is going? Because those things can deviate sometimes and be different, but can I keep those lines of efforts, you know, the, the ship moving in the right direction? Um, as close as possible so that we're keeping that big audacious goal out in front while living and working on the current reality. 
I really, really love that. And what a takeaway, uh, once again, uh, to really have that. So I've noted the moment down uh, at the minute that uh, you mentioned that, so I can go back and, and really delve into that a little yeah. bit more. But I love that because I'm able to take more away from you as we've delved into that and those big audacious goals. And um, that paradox, as you talk about in terms of how that can bring uh, a different narrative in terms of how you may think about uh, that approach towards goals, that approach towards where we are in the moment and that outlook towards the future, uh, which is something that plays very deeply on my mind each and every day that passes because I'm like, well, it's 4th of uh, January already. What what will it be before it's like suddenly December again and we're already looking at Christmas 2024? So for me, it's like every day is passing towards as we're achieving towards another goal, but I'm also wanting to maximise each and every day as much as possible. So, you know, I could have looked at this week and gone, you know what, it's my final week back of annual leave before I go back to teaching on Monday. I want to make the most of doing as little as I can to uh, before it's back busy late nights, early mornings, etc. It was like, you know what, actually I'm not maximising each and every day. I've relaxed earlier on in the week. I felt good for it. I feel a little bit refreshed, but where can I go? Can I get a podcast? calling can i read a book can i drop in by listening to another podcast etc so it's about building that back up before i start going well actually i relaxed yesterday i'm relaxing again tomorrow mm -hmm. i'm relaxing the day after and suddenly you know eight days have gone where i've not actually learned or developed anything and there's nothing wrong with taking that relaxation away but i feel sometimes if you're missing out on the moment you start to stack up those days you all end up not pushing yourself and you become complacent and that's a lot of thing that is always in the back of my mind is don't become too complacent don't become too comfortable because it will start to wear you down a little bit and you will start to be okay and that's where your motivation starts to fluctuate but over the last hour and 40 minutes of what we've been chatting it's been such a wonderful insight in terms of how you've bridged towards that framework that philosophy what you've been able to bring to your team how you've developed that over a few three-year period how that looks in terms of recruitment uh that course of recruitment over the the work with your players um how you work with your assistant coaches what you like on the sidelines how training looks that transition into match day uh the paradox that we have there how we talk about uh, big audacious goals um how we talk about context treating referees uh the different narratives of international scope uh club perspective and whether the, the the change of style in the game wow what a conversation in an hour and 40 minutes and we haven't even touched the surface we've covered some ground <laughs> it's been unreal just uh, how the conversations unfolded so uh i do really appreciate it shannon i appreciate how uh quickly you're able to get this organized and uh i'm conscious of time and let you go on time but uh i want to throw some quick fire questions at, at you as i do with every coach if that's okay yeah go for it smashing if you have to have someone describe you in three words what three words would they be Oh, I'm going to challenge you as a coach or as a person? As a coach. Creative, caring, and competitive. Love I that. Like alliteration. Love that for sure. Um, if you could move to any co uh, country to coach, where would it be? Oh, gosh. Ireland. It's where my family's roots are. A couple generations back now, <laughs> but still. And I haven't had a chance to get there. So I, I do think that that's my, my earnest answer. There's so many, though, that could be so I, – I, that's why I hesitated because there's so many cool places that you could go and coach right now. You don't get Ireland often much as an answer in response to that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could spend a day with any coach or manager, who would it be? Ooh, uh, Emma Hayes. Top answer. Yeah, right? I mean, that was true before she took the U.S. job too yeah. as well. But even more so now, I think – I mean, what – also, the rest of the world should be terrified that she is our manager now. I think she is just going to crush it. I think so as well. What a, a fantastic appointment. You know, I watched the Chelsea women's documentary on The Zone. What an insight in terms of... I wanted yeah. to watch another two, three, four seasons of that. I think it's unbelievable. I agree. There's a new one on Netflix too. Uh, I agree. That one was great. There's a new one that just came out, uh, Captains of the World, following the men's 2022 World Cup. Yeah. Quality. I've been burning through that one. It's on my to watch list, that one, definitely. <laughs> um, who was or is your role model? Um, I'm I'll, I'll give you two answers. I'll I'll say my parents because I think they've in you know, it's it's dumb to say this because hopefully this is true for many people, but they've influenced me more in my life and who I am and painting the picture of like how the person that I want to be than anybody else in my life. Um, and then there's a gentleman, uh, a coach named Michael Moynihan, who's the head coach at Northwestern University, who I got the great privilege to work under for five years. And I just think he is an excellent, not just coach in person, but learner. And that's something that I constantly 
like admire and think about is like how how much he engages in learning and bettering himself and that's something that I aspire to be and I, I'm lucky enough to call him a friend and, and peer um so yeah those two I love that what top close personal choices they are as well which is certainly fantastic um what is your number one top tip for any coach Never ask something of your players and staff that you want to ask of yourself. I love that. I think that's really important as well because sometimes we can over ask a lot from an individual which we can't do ourselves, and therefore it's realistic. It might be unrealistic to ask them. Uh, certainly, if it was back back to us to do so within the process as well. So uh, mm-hmm. I think that is such an important takeaway as well. Um, if you had the choice of any job in the world in terms of coaching, could be the Chelsea job, U.S. Women's National Team, any job. What job would it be? Um. All right, I'm going to cheat again. I'm going to give you two answers. I think there's something really cool about coaching at your alma mater, like a place that you have roots before. So there is something intriguing to me about the opportunity of coaching at the university that I attended, which is Ohio State. Um, but the the real immediate answer is, uh, like I mentioned, my husband is uh, is uh, a um, American football coach. So really, just somewhere that we can we're, we're he has a small apartment because we're four and a half hours away from each other in terms of our jobs right now. So somewhere that we could live in the same place, whether it's my job closer to his or his job closer to mine is the the real answer, especially now that we have two kids, because that is a bear of an existence at the moment. So that would be nice. <laughs> Wow, what what a commitment that is mine. Four and a half hours in between kids, both coaching as well. And as you said earlier, in the back of my mind, it's like it's great that you can date someone who's in the same profession as you because you can able to relate about recruitment and everything else that goes into it. But how difficult is it as well by you know matching up your sort of time frames, traveling, being away, getting in those recruitment calls yourself, how difficult it might be after you know a long night and you just want to switch off, etc. You know, it, it's not an easy gig, you know that. But wow, fair play to both of you and uh uh, you know, it's 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 you know fantastic that you're both in the professions that you love doing. Yeah, and listen, it, it's like it's not easy, like you said. Like it's definitely a challenge. But you know, we've talked a lot about the things that you've pulled as an athlete into your life. Like there's so much of who we were as athletes that have helped us manage what we're in the middle of right now. How do you handle frustration? How do you handle challenge? How do you? Great to reference back to that big audacious goal, like we're really in a place professionally right now where we're trying to allow each of us to not step off of our professional path to concede to our private life because we both want to continue to do this. So we're managing the challenges and the realities of our current circumstances so that we can stay on that path towards that big audacious goal of keeping coaching and staying in the profession. Because as many of us know, sometimes those professional difficulties and challenges are easy reasons to step out of it. And for some people, that's the right choice. And for us right now, it doesn't feel like the right choice to step off of that path. So we're working really hard for one another to make sure that we both get to pursue that piece while pursuing our personal lives and starting a family and and trying to do both which is not easy. <laughs> I love that. And, I, you know, it just shows what commitment because not every couple in that situation would do that. So fair play to both of you. Wow, that is an unbelievable sentiment to have between each other. So uh, it's a good thing that you yeah. found each other. He's a good guy. I, I, I... I got lucky. I found that guy. <laughs> hey, you both got lucky. Uh, definitely, for sure, for sure. Um, if you weren't coaching and you weren't didn't have a job in this sector, what would you be doing? You know, I've thought a lot about that as I've gotten down the line, and especially with our, uh, you know, my personal situation that I just shared, because it's like, okay, if I, you know, moved to him, and I couldn't coach, what would I do, or could I make money doing something else? So there's a couple different things. Like as I've gotten longer in this profession. There are so many services and organizations and people who are making a life and making a profession just doing like team and culture development independently of working with directly a team. And I don't know if I would like that because I like the intimate relation of being with the team that I'm helping develop. So it it is different, but I've considered that. Uh, And I also have a really strong and high passion in the arts. It's actually what I went to school for. I got a a degree from university in the fine arts and then a different one in industrial design. So something in that field has always kind of been in the back of my mind as well. Hey, you never know what the future might hold, but don't give up sport for as much as you can. Who is your all-time favorite player? 
Oh my God. What a question. Um, Casillas was one of the first that like really rooted me in watching like the, the professional game. Cause I found him in Madrid. So it really pulled me in. Plus it was like a really fun time. Like when I was in high school, so it's like that, that like early two thousands range where that team was just flying and the, the people playing on it was really cool. Um, so historically I'll, I'll definitely say that, you know, growing up in the States, Michelle Akers was one that again, just watching her play, there was just this great awe that I still have when I think about who she was and, and players that influenced me. Um, you know, and she unfortunately played and competed in a time where there really wasn't the professional leagues. It was just international play for her. So I don't think she gets referenced and named as much as she probably should. Now I'm, now I'm, I'm deviating on you because you asked for one and I've already given you two, but I always try to go on the men's and the women's side. Cause I think that's important. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm in a place now where the people that I competed and played against are retiring from like those that made a profession in it. So that's really fun too, to see, you know, Christine Sinclair and Allie Krieger and those players that I, I got to say, Oh, once upon a time when I was on the field, uh, getting to see them kind of live out the, the, the great successes that they've had and seen them and being able to say like, once upon a time, I was playing against them as a peer. I was nowhere near them. I mean, it's like one of those funny things, right? Like a highlight of my college career was getting scored on by Christine St. Clair. And I'm like, that shouldn't be a highlight, but it is. Um, th those are cool things. Uh, but yeah, those are a couple that come to mind in terms of players from past past playing eras that um, had a high influence on me. Good choices. Absolutely great choices. Um, if you had to give three non-negotiables as a coach, what would they be? For my players or for myself? Well, it could be both, could be either. It's up to you. True, true. A uh, high overlap in there. I'll, I'll say work rate. If you give me a player that has an undying work rate, I'll probably try to leverage them more than I should at times. Uh, it'll, I'll, maybe I'll say it this way. Sometimes it will cover up a lot of uh, deficits that they have in terms of how I think of them as a player. Uh, so that is a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, accountability is big in my world. Uh, I am, I try tirelessly to create clarity of my expectations, you know, on field off small details to the broader picture things. So if you know something like, Hey, this is what we wear to training that follow through is huge for me because to me, that's an attention and a commitment to your team and the other people working for you. And some people don't think those little details matter. I think they all add up. Um, a lot of people have an easy time being accountable to the big things, but they don't understand that those little things influence the big things. So I don't care if you show up and score goals. I mean, I do, but if you're late to team meetings all the time, you're not going to be on the field to score those goals. So accountability would be two. Um, and then I think the simplest way to describe it is respect how you care and are kind for other people around you. Cause I think that full stop, no matter circumstance, it has to be true for me to want to continue to work with you. You're never going to be perfect. My job is to help you get better at things that you're failing at or that you're not as strong at. But as long as you're kind and have the best intentions for others, I will always try to do that for you. What a top three non-negotiables there that you have and uh, the detail that goes with them, which is really important as well. Um, what does reflection mean to you? learning. Um, I think those that reflect and take the time to take in that information are trying to be great learners because some of the best lessons learned are from your experience. But if you're not taking time to process and look back on it with clarity of hindsight, you're missing a lot of information that you can take forward in hopefully your future pursuits. We love that. Fantastic. And the final one, what is the one thing you enjoy most about coaching? The people. It's it's silly and it's cheesy, but it's true because they're the, the uh, thing that creates 
you know, you get new people every year. You send out your people who graduate into the big, broader world. So it's fun to hear where they're going and what they're bringing back. And they're the things that create the constant variety in your space because people are always changing, whether it's from one week to the next, one year to the next, one decade to the next. Working with an individual is never the same, let alone working with a group of individuals. So that's the biggest puzzle that we're working with is the people. And it's the most fun and most rewarding part of it. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And um, what a fantastic almost two hour period that we have spent together. <laughs> and as said, I do <laughs> really appreciate it. No, thank you so much. It's been, uh, like I said, one of one of the best things that we get to do is work with and interact with the soccer nerds of the world like yourself and people who are passionate about using the game as a vehicle for other things. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. Well, I, I, again, I appreciate your time and uh, I hope you have the enjoyable rest of the day and that you uh, uh, proceed well in 2024. But uh, I look forward to uh, releasing this. But again, thank you very much for me and uh, uh, take care. Same to you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Bye. But yeah, we try to be that group that can help be there for the players as a three, because I think you mentioned earlier, you want to have different characters in the changing room. You want to have different personalities. You don't want the same kind of people because you're not going to be able to move forward. If you've got 10 people and they all agree the same things, you're going to get to a point in time where actually you're going to become unstuck. You need that one person to actually be like, no, nah, I don't agree with that. Or actually, we should try this. And I think that's why the huddle works is we're all quite different as human beings. And I think you need three different people in there because some players will naturally gravitate towards me and my personality, but equally some might go to the other two and that's, that's absolutely fine.